speaking, talking about fertilizer impact supply and demand factors for quite a while. And I think it's starting to make some huge headway in starting to understand what influences the marketplace. Now, we'll see shortly if that has any impact on buying and selling decisions. However, what we are wanting to make sure is that we have the proper and most up-to-date numbers and educational pieces that we can provide from the industry standpoint. A huge piece of our education centers around 4R nutrient stewardship. Most in the room are familiar with 4R, I'd imagine, making the right fertilizer choices, so source rate, timing, and placement decisions. And if there's ever been a time for increased nutrient stewardship, if there's ever been a time for making sure that we're using product efficiently, not just for an environmental standpoint, but more importantly for economic standpoint right now, this has been one of the best times that we've ever been able to educate folks around the industry's infield sustainability program, which is the four R's of nutrient stewardship. And for several years, we've seen nutrient use efficiency across the board pick up in the U.S. So nutrient use as far as crop removal to input ratios from a world level, you see that the U.S. far exceeds the world average. Um, and when you get down to our 4R advocates, which are um, top tier producers that we've awarded um, for implementing a 4R nutrient stewardship strategy in their operation before, they blow all of these folks out of the water. Top tier producers, which I'm sure are the majority of the folks in the room, you're seeing huge increases in nutrient use efficiency across the board. When you see numbers from from the EU, when you see numbers from USDA, um, we talked about the USDA grant for climate smart commodities proposal come through um, in the previous discussion. A lot of things that are already happening in the field in the US crop industry are already pointing to how efficient and productive US producers are compared to the rest of the world. And we have to make sure that that trend continues. So from our side of things, I just like to put this up to show we're moving in the right track, we're moving in the right production side of things, and we're the most efficient producers in the world. A few examples of this, you can take a look. We have a website, 4rfarming.org, puts together a cost structure um, and case study examples to show how as one's nutrient use efficiency increases, their overall economic impact also comes into play. So, when we look at combining all these factors into one, education for our nutrient stewardship, and of course, understanding supply and demand and market factors, we can still continue to be a huge source of information, a huge impact as far as world commodity prices and crops are concerned. And I know that there are a lot of factors out there that I have not touched on, but that's why we're gonna leave several minutes for questions here in just a minute. But what I would like to say in closing on this side is that as factors in the marketplace continue to fluctuate, continue to change, the industry is paying attention to those. We're wanting to make sure that we have the proper education out there. We want to make sure that we can answer your questions efficiently. And also, we want to make sure that if there's anything that we can do to alleviate um, heartache out there through education and through, through um, we just want to make sure that we're there to be able to do that. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all may have. My email is also up here from y'all. If you have questions that you want to follow up with, please don't hesitate to reach out. More than happy to talk with you, more than happy to provide any information that we can from that side as well. So I'll ask if there's any questions from anybody. Hi, Peyton. Scott Piercy with Pool Agribusiness. Um, some recent announcements from, from some producers. I know Russia announced yesterday that they're going to increase nitrogen exports. <clears throat> Yara announced this morning that they're going to increase some ammonia production in France and Italy. Can we interpret this as maybe a trend of some more nitrogen production, more availability? Or do you have any idea? I would say that it's a positive signal, Scott. Um, you know, in the past, when we've seen them do this, we've seen, um, you know, the impact on capacity does not necessarily impact the availability of those products as well from where we're gonna need them to be. 
Um, so from an overall standpoint, I, I can't say whether or not that that's going to you know, signal a huge increase in that, but I can say I think that it is a positive factor that we can look to and will hopefully continue to trend in that direction. Anyone else? All right. Well, with that, I'll say thank you to everybody. Um, really appreciate y'all's time and for being here today. And again, if you ever have any questions as far as fertilizer markets are concerned, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're more than happy to provide information and work with you the best that we can. And I hope y'all have a great rest of the day. Okay, thank you, Peyton, for that very informative uh, presentation. All I can say is we've still got our health, I guess. <laughs> we will now hear from Tiffany Lashman on the do's and don'ts of carbon contracts. Tiffany. Okay, thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm excited to be here. My name is Tiffany Lashman. I'm the Extension Agricultural Law Specialist for Texas A&M. Uh, I'm based out of Amarillo. I have um, statewide responsibilities, so, and so I'm thrilled to be with you here today to talk a little bit about carbon contracts, which I think is a really interesting topic. You've probably heard a lot about it in the news. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the contractual and legal considerations you need to keep in mind if you're looking at or negotiating one of these carbon contracts. So I'll start off, I, when I speak, I have to give you a little disclaimer. It basically says I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, all right? So, I'm here to give you general information today, cannot give specific legal advice. If you want that, you have to find somebody who you're paying by the hour. Okay, and I suspect Cody's giving me a cap today, it's the payment I'm getting. So, uh, not, no specific advice today. Just a couple of general thoughts when we start off, um, and then we'll jump into some specific items I want you to really look for in these contracts. The first thing I wanna say is every contract is different, and not just kind of different, they're very different when you look at these. So, Please, if you are, are looking at a contract or analyzing it, don't rely on something you've seen in another contract or read in the newspaper or what your neighbor says his contract says because the different companies have vastly different terms that you really need to be aware of. Uh, this is some advice from an attorney I know who's negotiating a lot of these. He says he tells clients the first question he has them ask the company is, are you willing to negotiate on the contract? If the answer is no, that they won't negotiate any terms, he tells his clients, we're not gonna waste our time then, right? Uh, we're just not. So that's a good question to ask. To glance at the contract, ask them, are you willing to negotiate any of this? And that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, how much time you may wanna spend. If you see a term that's just a deal breaker for you and they won't negotiate, we probably need to move on. And that's the next thing is you need to know what your deal breakers are. I'm gonna walk you through 10 questions to ask. And the things we're gonna talk about are gonna vary from, I don't care at all, that doesn't bother me, to, well, that's kind of annoying, to absolute deal breaker, I'm not signing that contract. And which one falls into which bucket is gonna depend entirely on your operation. So you need to think as we walk through these, which of these are deal breakers for me? And when you're reading through a contract, it's those deal breakers that you're really looking for. Okay, the last thing I wanna say, um, I'm Switzerland in this whole situation. I'm neutral, I don't care if you sign a carbon contract or not, okay? I do wanna make sure though that before we sign one, we understand what we're signing, right? We understand what our obligations are and everybody's on the same page about what we're doing, all right? So with that, I'm gonna give you a top 10 list of carbon contract considerations. And I am gonna to try to leave quite a bit of time at the end for questions, so feel free, um, if you have questions, I'm glad to take those at the end, okay? So starting off, number one, what's the number one thing a lawyer is gonna tell you? Read the contract. The whole contract. I don't mean like farmer read, right? Which the farmer read is what? You read the first paragraph and you think, every lawyer's worthless. And then you go find the dollar amount number. That's how farmers read contracts. I know, I'm married to one, my daddy is one, okay? I don't mean that. I mean, we're going to actually read the entire contract and try to understand it, okay? We have to read them. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put our pinkies up, everybody, pinky in the air. Pinky finger in the air. Rick Ackerman, I mean you too, pinky finger in the air, okay? 
repeat after me, I pinky promise, I will not sign a contract unless I have read the contract. To be clear, that's not legally binding, okay? But, but I'm pretty aggressive and I'm watching you. So you remember, if you sign one without reading it, you remember this face, okay? All right, so we have to read the contract. We have to understand what's in them. All right, as we read them, here are the things I want you to look for. I think the first thing we have to know is what practices are you required to do, right? What are your obligations? Typically in these carbon contracts, we see uh, no-till, strip-till, uh, cover crops, regenerative grazing. That's typically the practices we see. But make sure you really understand what you're agreeing to do or not do. So there are some contracts that say things like, I agree to undertake conservation practices. I don't know what that means, okay? And if the contract just says, I agree to undertake conservation practices, and then something like, we'll let you know what those are after you have signed up and we've reviewed your data. I'm not signing that, right? I'm not gonna agree up front to do something that I don't know what it is. So really pay attention to what you're required to do. A big issue that we see in these carbon contracts is the um, concept of additionality. Additionality basically means, what if you've already adopted these? So what if I'm already using cover crops? Can I now sign up for a carbon contract and get an additional payment for a practice I'm already doing? It depends on the contract, okay? There are some contracts that say no. It has to be a new practice that you adopt pursuant to the contract in order to qualify. Some of the contracts let you have what they're calling a look back period. Uh, one of them I've seen says if you have started your practice in the last year, you can qualify. I've seen one that says five years and I, I've heard there's one out there that says 10 years. So if you've only adopted cover crops, for example, in the last 10 years, maybe you can qualify under certain contracts. So if you've already adopted some of these practices, you're not excluded, you may just have to look harder for the specific contract that will work for you, all right? Number three, how's payment gonna be structured, right? This is kind of a big one for us. How am I gonna get paid? Uh, the biggest thing here, don't just look at the number, okay? There are a lot of different nuances that you need to pay attention to when you're evaluating these contracts. Um, the first thing is they sort of structure them typically in two ways. One of them is payment for practice. The other one is payment for outcome. So a payment for practice contract would say, if you adopt this practice, you're gonna get paid on it. Think something like CRP, right? If I do what I agree to, I, I use you know, no-till or strip-till, I get paid. A payment for outcome contract says, I'm gonna do what I agree, and then they're gonna come measure the carbon in the soil and I get paid on the change, right, the increase in carbon that I actually have. So two different structures, right? One of them you get paid just for adopting the practice. The other one you get paid only if the outcome is positive increase of carbon stored in the soil. Make sure you understand which contract you're signing because that really matters, all right? How are they structured? Some of them, generally the practice ones, are a flat fee per acre. Right, you're gonna get X amount of dollars per acre. Uh, typically on the payment for outcome, what you'll see is so payment for ton of carbon uh, sequestered or reduced from emission. So payment per ton of carbon, right? Uh, generally speaking, and again, all the contracts are different, you're probably looking at somewhere in that 15 to $20 per ton of carbon stored, all right? Uh, an important thing to know here is what is included in those measurements. So when they come out and they're gonna tell you how many tons of carbon you have stored, what all are they including? Are they just looking at carbon? Are they gonna measure other greenhouse gases as well? How are they gonna measure those? Are we gonna look only at what has actually been stored in the dirt? Or are we also looking at the reduction of greenhouse gas we've emitted, like with our tractor, right, for example? It differs on the contracts, so you have to pay attention to that, all right? The, I think probably if I'm gonna give you one thing, this might be the most important thing I'm gonna say to you today. Understand the potential for carbon sequestration in your area. Here's why that matters. A lot of these contracts are quoting that dollar amount to you 
on a per ton, metric ton of carbon basis. So it'll say, we're gonna pay you $20 per metric ton of carbon. And a lot of people are thinking, okay, so that's $20 per acre per year. That's how we hear that. That's true if you store a metric ton of carbon in a year. You get $20, right? Anybody know what they tell me in the Panhandle South Plains area our carbon sequestration potential is per year? Dr. Lewis tells me it's more like 0.1, not one. And I'm no mathematician, okay? But all of a sudden, a $20 payment, if it's 0.1, goes to a $2 payment. And I don't know about you, but I'm more apt to jump through a lot of hoops for a $20 payment, a lot more than I am for a $2 payment, right? So you have to understand what your sequestration potential is when you're analyzing how valuable from an economic perspective, how valuable these contracts might be, okay? And that point one that she mentioned to me, that's kind of an average in a good year on farm ground. In a drought year, that number goes down. On rangeland, that number goes down, okay? So just keep that in mind. Uh, what's the term of the contract? How long does it last? Also important. Um, again, I, they're all different. Generally speaking, I think they're in that 10, 10 to 20 year range is uh, typically what I've seen. Do watch for any extensions though. And this is true in a lot of contracts that you sign. You'll sign a 10 year contract and oftentimes at the end, the company you're contracting with has the right to do an extension um, at their option. They have the option to execute an extension on that contract to make it last longer. That's never going to benefit you. Okay? And the reason is, think about it. If I've got a 10-year contract, right, and at the end of it, price has gone way up, and I've got you for cheap, what am I going to do? Extend the contract, right, if I'm the, if I'm the company. On the flip side, if price has gone way down and I'm paying you too much money and I'm the company, what am I going to do? Cut you loose, right? That extension never benefits the person because it's all it's the company's discretion to make it. Watch for any discussions of permanence. And again, this differs by contract, and some of the contracts are kind of fuzzy on what happens. But, but let's say we sign a 10-year contract, and we do no-till for 10 years, and we store all this carbon. What happens on 10 years and one day? Can we plow it all up, and now all the carbon we stored is gone? It depends on the contract, but you better understand if you have any continuing obligations beyond the term of that contract. Okay, this one's important too. I hear this a lot, people um, considering these contracts or pushing these contracts will say, just try it. If you don't like it, you can just walk away. Let me tell you a trick of the trade. It's very rare you can truly just walk away from a contract, right? That's why lawyers have jobs, okay? It's just, just not how it works. So it may be that they'll let you in the contract, right? You can terminate a contract. That's generally true on a lot of these. But just walking away is a different thing. So pay attention to what the penalties are for that early termination they will allow. On some of them, it's a uh, pretty standard, like, you know, if you, if you terminate it early, you have to um, give back any bonus payments we've made. You may have to give back any prepayments we've made, that kind of stuff. Some of them are, are different than that. Some of them are like stricter. And they say things like, if you terminate it early, you have to pay us back for every expense we had on this contract. So think about what that could roll in, right? All the cost of measurement, every time they've come out and measured during that term, lawyer fees for drafting and negotiating that contract, all of a sudden we could owe them back a lot of money. So pay attention to that um, termination language. Also, watch for contracts that have a vesting provision. Several of them have this. Um, and this is similar if you've had like a, you know, a 401k or something at a job that vests over time. So some of them will have a five-year vesting procedure, which means let's say that the first year that we earn $10,000, they owe us $10,000. It vests at 20% a year, which means if we walk in year two, we don't get $10,000, right? We get $4,000 because it's only vested at 40%. So watch for those. Some of the contracts have those as well. Okay, how is verification or measurement going to be done? Also an important question. 
um, are, are, if they come out and they're going to try and figure out, right, how much carbon have we sequestered, how much emissions have we um, limited or decreased by making these changes, how are they going to measure that? Sometimes they'll actually measure, typically speaking, I think as far as soil carbon, they're going to actually measure. Some of the other they're going to have to model, right? And that's like the emissions we have reduced will probably be modeling. Uh, if they're going to talk about measurements, a few things to look out for. How are they going to measure? When are they going to measure? Where are they going to measure, right? Because when they come out to your place, I, I wish I had the map that Anson Howard showed at Cattle Razors last week. When they come out, they're not going to like poke a hole and go home. It's everywhere. They're taking soil core samples everywhere all over the place. Okay? So it's going to be much um, more invasive than that. Are you going to get noticed before they show up? I probably want that, right? I'm asking. If you're going to come take samples, I want to know when you're going to be there. I also want to know when it's going to be, right? Like, if I have deer hunters, probably opening weekend, not ideal for them to be out there poking all their holes in the ground, right? So just think about that as well. Um, who's going to conduct the testing? Generally, I think that they use like a third party tester, right? So they would hire a third party to come and do the testing. Uh, what methodology is going to be used and who's going to pay for it? Who's on the hook to pay for all of this testing? It really should be the company. And I think most of the contracts provide for that, but, but watch that, right? You don't want to be the one who has to pay for all of the testing. Um, this is interesting. The ability for a landowner or a producer to audit or appeal the determinations they make when they sample. So some of the contracts, there's one in particular that says, if there is a dispute about the results of our measurements, okay, you can make that dispute, but the final decision is made by the company, you have no right to appeal it. So let's say they come out and measure and you're like, there's no way that can be right. And it's a big hit on you because if you're getting paid by how much you've stored, and let's say they say, well, you, you lost carbon this time, and now we're not getting paid and maybe we have to pay them back. You can't appeal what that company's measurer said. So watch for those kind of clauses as well. Okay, number six, what other uses can you make on the property? Um, you need to know if you're gonna sign a carbon contract, what else can be done or not? For example, hunting. If you've got a hunting lease, can they still hunt on the property? It, again, maybe so, but you need to make sure that's okay in your contract. Also make sure we understand that we need to make changes to our hunting lease. For example, if you're, you have rangeland, maybe you can still have hunters. You may not want to have them out there with ATVs all over the place, right, when we're thinking about trying to keep carbon stored in the soil. So you just got to think about those issues as well. What about oil and gas production? Can oil and gas production coexist with this carbon contract? What about wind or solar energy, right? What if you sign a carbon contract for $20 a metric ton, and let's just say that's more like $2 an acre, and then we get an option to enter into a solar contract and they're paying $800 an acre. Am I stuck now, or is there a way to make those work together? I don't know, but it's something you need to think about. Okay, number seven, what penalties could be imposed? You need to be clear in that contract and you need to understand in your mind what um, could trigger a penalty or liability for you. And this is where I'm going to say, understand that your legal agreement with the company is only based on what is written in that contract. What someone says to you from the company about the contract, doesn't matter. Okay? So I looked at one of these and it talks about if... Um, if you lose carbon, so they come out, they do a baseline measurement. Let's say we have 10 tons of carbon. They come back in a year and we have eight. Some of the contracts say, you're paying us back for the difference. You've now terminated the contract. We can kick you out. We can collect damages. Yikes, right? You need to know what triggers that penalty. On that same contract, is that my kid with the giant cotton ball he's holding up in the back? Good, my kids are here and they've apparently been to the trade show, is what I just noticed, okay. Um, you need to know what triggers that penalty because sometimes that what they'll say is, and I know on this contract, but what the company said was, that's only if you intentionally cause the loss of carbon. Don't worry about it. As long as you don't go like set it on fire or plow it up, it's fine. That's lovely that he's saying that, but the contract doesn't say that, right? And legally speaking, his comment, you're never gonna get that in in court because you have that contractual agreement. So just watch that. Um, some of the contracts do say you're liable if carbon is lost. 
And again, a lot of times that's out of your control. We can't control droughts. We can't control wildfires. We can't control measurement errors. Okay, so just keep that in mind as well. Um, big deal here, how broad is the stacking provision? All of these contracts are going to have a stacking provision and what it says basically is you can't enroll this land you have for carbon in another carbon contract. That makes perfect sense to me, right? Uh, if I have my, you know, half a section and I've enrolled it in company A's program, I can't also enroll it in company B's program and double collect the money. That's fair. But some of these are written more broadly than that. And they say things like, you cannot collect under any government programs for the same land. What's that mean? Equip, ARC, PLC, um, CRP. I don't know what it means for crop insurance, right? That makes me real antsy. So watch out for those as well. Now, some of them also say you can't enroll in any government carbon programs. So we talked, I think that they talked earlier maybe about there could potentially be some carbon programs coming from FSA or NRCS. Keep in mind that if you sign one of these that's got that language, you may not qualify for those carbon programs. And will those programs be better than these private contracts we have? I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think you need to ask yourself that question. Okay, number nine, what data do you have to provide? Again, differs by contract, but I'll tell you this, you better be ready to just open up your farm books to whoever you're doing a contract with because they, they're very broad in the data they may want you to provide to them. So I just pulled a few things I thought were, I mean, you, you'll see in these. Uh, fuel use, so they may want to know how much fuel you've used on your operation over the last five years. Calving dates, birth weights, conception percentages, yield, pesticide application volumes, fire history, they want all this data, and again, what they're trying to do is use a modeling, I don't know the term, modeling thing, to tell them how much additional carbon you're not releasing because of your change in practice. But you gotta give them all this data. Another thing that they almost all have is rights of entry onto your property. They differ in how broad those might be. Some of them are like blanket rights that they can come enter your property like at any time, anywhere, for any purpose. Probably most of you don't like that. Okay, here's another interesting one for me. Every contract I've seen allows for aerial imaging and drone flights over the property. I know that to some of you that's a problem, and do you know how I know that? I get your phone calls about once a month, and what do they ask me about a drone? Can I shoot it down? Every time, once a month, I can set my clock by it. I know that you guys don't like these. Understand, and some of it, all the ones I've seen, if you sign a carbon contract, you're gonna let them fly a drone over and take pictures and, and measurements and data, et cetera, okay? Um, one other thing on the data, any data that they, um, you provide them or they collect, all the contracts I've seen say that it is your data. You still retain ownership of that, but they're gonna have the right to use it for different things. So just um, do keep that in mind as well. Okay, the last one I call my father's favorite section, so my dad is, we have a farm and ranch in New Mexico, um, and my dad has been there for generations. He took over when he was 14, when his daddy died of a heart attack. He's been running it ever since. Um, I preach and preach at him about how we gotta get all our contracts in writing. You can imagine how fun I am to have as a daughter, right, on that issue. And so I, he's had a free lawyer for like 15 years. We still have stuff that's not written down, I don't know. So a couple years ago, he calls me and he says, Tiff, we're gonna lease the place across the road and I want you to do a written contract. And I'm like, well, miracles have occurred. And then he follows up and he says, but I don't want all your legal crap in there. You get one page, okay? So I wrote him a one page lease. Does it have everything I would like in it? No. Is it better than the nothing we had before? You bet, okay? I call this my father's favorite section because it's all the legal crap we don't have in his contract, okay? Uh, one thing to watch, and really watch this, is how any amendments to the contract are handled. So we sign the contract now, we're in it for 10 years, can it be amended? Some of them allow the company to amend it at any time. One in particular I thought was interesting, it says the company can amend the contract at any time by sending an email to you. You have 30 days to respond to the email if you want to object. 
If you don't respond, the amendment is valid, okay? And if you do respond, the company could take that as a breach of the contract and then kick you out of the program. That was wild to me. I have not seen a contract like that before, but watch for that, okay? Uh, rights to assign, right? Can you assign the contract to someone else? Maybe more importantly, can they assign the contract to someone else? Because everybody's doing their homework on these companies and really thinking about who we're signing up with. Most of the contracts are gonna let them assign their rights under that contract to anybody else, okay? So you sign up with company A because you like them, you trust them, they can assign that contract to company B who you never would have gotten in bed with, right? So just think about that assignment provision. On the flip side, it's interesting, some of the limits on your right to assign. Maybe the next one, no. What happens if, the, if you need to sell the property during the term of the contract? Some of them say no problem, as long as the buyer agrees to continue, we'll just let them step right in and take over. Some of them are gonna treat that like you breached the contract and know those early termination penalties may come into play. Uh, an attorney fee provision, that can be real important. Right? I don't know, I don't know how, if you're familiar with this, but uh, generally speaking in America, win, lose, or draw, everybody pays for their own lawyer, right? One way to change that is by um, agreement in a contract. So we could say something like, in the event we have a legal dispute, the prevailing party can recover their reasonable attorney's fees. Okay, so that may be something to watch for in the contract as well. You might ask them if they'll offer any sort of payment or like um, assistance with you, for you hiring a lawyer to negotiate and draft the contract for you. Sometimes you'll get these, I don't know about in carbon, in solar I've seen them though, where if a solar company is negotiating with a landowner, some of them will say, here, we're gonna give you $5,000, go find a lawyer to represent you on this contract. It might be something to ask for, I don't know if the companies will go for it or not. Choice of law and venue clause is super important. A choice of law clause says, in the event of a dispute, which state's law is going to apply? I've seen a bunch of these contracts. Guess how many of them apply Texas law? None that I've seen. Now, there could be one out there. The ones I've seen don't. It's like Tennessee law or Massachusetts law or wherever their corporate headquarters is located. Okay? And then to go along with that, there usually is a venue clause that says, in the event of a dispute, it has to be filed in X county in X state. Again, guess how many of them say Lubbock County, Texas? A and why does that matter? If we're picking a jury, you know who I would like the pool to look like? This, right? Lubbock County. I it's probably much harder to pick a jury in Boston. Okay, so just think about that on those clauses. Uh, dispute resolution, oftentimes you'll see this in any contract, it's just a provision by which we try to um, uh, handle or settle disputes out of court. And that's good for everybody, okay? But understand there's two different types of dispute resolution. I just want you to understand the difference. Uh, sometimes the contracts will say you're agreeing to mediation in a contract. Mediation means plaintiff, defendant, go sit down with a mediator. Just a neutral third party. Sometimes it's a lawyer, sometimes it's a retired judge. And that mediator basically sings kumbaya and tries to get everybody to get on the same page and settle, right? If both parties can agree to a settlement, then we sign a mediation agreement, we settle, everybody goes home. If both parties don't agree to a settlement, then mediation just didn't work. You go to court the next day, file your lawsuit, and we're in front of a judge. Okay, that's mediation. Arbitration's another option, but it's different. Under arbitration, what you'll have is plaintiff, defendant, third-party arbitrator, or sometimes it's like a panel of three, okay? The plaintiff puts on her case, the defendant puts on her case, and the arbitrator acts like a judge and picks a winner. He doesn't care if you agree, right? They're the judge. So you essentially trade your day in court for your day in arbitration. And generally speaking, that arbitration award is binding and can be enforced just like a court order. And if you don't like it, you don't get to go to a judge, okay? And, I mean, there are limited exceptions to that, but, but just not liking it aren't it. So they're not bad, both of them save you time and money, they're just different, so understand the difference. Okay, this is interesting, I've never seen these before. All of the carbon contracts I've looked at have a class action waiver in them. So a class action lawsuit, right, generally speaking, if I get mad and I wanna sue Plains Cotton Growers, I, Tiffany, file my lawsuit against Plains Cotton Growers. 
There are some times in the law, though, where my dispute, right, my damages are really small and it doesn't, it's not worth it for me to go file my lawsuit. But a bunch of us have the same damages. So the court will say, all right, we're going to appoint Tiffany as the representative for everybody who's similarly, similarly situated and has similar claims, and we'll let there be one lawsuit against Plains Congress. Does that make sense? So you guys saw this, if, you're, if you uh, grow corn, you saw this with Syngenta, right? There was like a couple of representatives that represented everybody who claims they were harmed by the Syngenta uh, corn situation, okay? All of the carbon contracts I've seen have a class action waiver, which says, by signing this contract, I agree, I am not able to take part in any class action lawsuit filed against this company. In other words, if there's a big class action later about everybody who signed a carbon contract, you've agreed legally that you're not gonna be a part of it. You can still bring your own claim, but you can't be in the class action. I think that's interesting from a broader picture, and I wonder if we're gonna start seeing that in more ag contracts. Because in the last decade, we've seen a bunch of these ag class actions pop up. So this may be a new defense um, kind of mechanism that companies are putting in. No one cares about that but me, but I think it's fascinating, okay? Um, the last thing, check the scope of the waiver clauses. In a contract, it's pretty standard for there to be a waiver of liability clause, and, right? And we all have it. It basically just says, I'm not liable for anything the company does, and the company's not liable for anything I do. That's standard, that's fine. Some of these are broader though, and talk about like, I will waive my right to make any claim against the company for anything including like breach of contract claims, or I, there was a whole list on one of them that just made me feel sweaty. I didn't love that. So watch out for that uh, as well. Okay, the last thing I'm going to give you is a couple of resources, and then I'm glad to take any questions that you might have um, about carbon contracts. I've got a blog, so if y'all are interested in ag law, um, I just do a post like every week. Uh, so if a new case comes out, if there's a handbook I do or a checklist, I've got a checklist on carbon up here. You can just Google Texas Ag Law blog and it'll pop up um, for you there. So I have that. I also have a podcast. Um, if you're a podcast listener, you can find us on all of your podcast apps. We're called Ag Law in the Field. If you have no idea what a podcast is, that's okay too. Uh, it's just I do an audio interview with an ag lawyer or another expert uh, and I post it for you to listen to online for free. So if you go to that website at the top or you scan that little box with your phone, um, what you're going to do is you're just going to get a list of all my interviews. You can just pick the topic you want and push play. I've done 127 of them. So we've kind of covered the gamut. There is, I think it's a great one on carbon contracts we did with a lawyer here in Texas and a lawyer in Indiana. Um, so that's available as well. Okay, the last slide is kind of like my business card. It's got my contact information. I'm on social media. Um, if you guys need to track me down, get a hold of your extension agent, get a hold of Cody, he can find me. Um, if y'all have questions after today, if you need more information, I'm sure glad to help with whatever I can. Okay? With that, I'll take any questions. Oh, boy. Uh, Lloyd Arthur, producer from Crosby County. First of all, I've listened to you, and you bring out some good marks. And just to show you that I've learned, I got a couple of questions asked. Has, is this free, or are you going to charge me? I'll send you a bill later. And 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 if us discussion, do I have an attorney-client privilege <laughs> from now? No, because we've got a room full of people. On the carbon credit deal, uh, a couple of comments and then a question. I actually read one about a week or 10 days ago. I had some concerns. I addressed it with the folks giving it to me. And they pointed out one or two of the same ones. And then me being a farmer, a lot of that was over my head. And they pulled out uh, some more that was probably more restrictive than what, what I pulled out. I'm not limiting this to Amazon or anybody else, but you know, if they want to buy my carbon, to be where they can be carbon neutral by 2035, I have a commodity that they think is valuable. Just like any other agriculture commodity, somebody's telling me what my product is worth. Correct, you're a price taker, yep. Has this gone too far on this that we can't steer the boat the other direction and have either some farm organizations or groups, A&M or somebody develop a contract for us to present to them telling this is my product, 
negotiate the price and this is the rules we're going to play with because I don't want to sign any of their contracts and the more I read the more I dig into this I'm going to spend $25 to get their $2 so can something like that be developed for us at what charge or cost or who can do that because I'm tired of having them present me with a contract you got to do this this and this and you might get this but yet they're the ones that's wanting my commodity. I need your commodity. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. So, so, so to start off, like, no, I don't think we're too far. We're at the very infancy of this. Okay, I mean, we're, we're just starting. These companies are just getting started. We're just seeing the contracts. No, I don't think we've gone too far for something like that to happen. The kicker is we're going to have to get together and, and people will have to get together and do it, right? And as long as people are signing their contracts, right, the contracts that the company's giving you, what incentive do they have to go over here and take your contract? So. That's where I think it gets tricky to play hardball is if people are taking theirs and not pushing back, they're not going to take yours. So that's one thing I would say. Could a group get together? I, I think Dr. Morano asked me this the last time I did this presentation. Yeah, sure. I think a group could get together and come up with here's our price, here's our terms, here's what we're going to offer and, and, and shop it around to people. Will they accept it? I don't know. But there's certainly nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, I will tell you, and like I say, some of the, some of the groups have just said they won't negotiate on their contracts. Like, I've heard someone say, this is the contract we're offering, other people are signing it, you can sign it or not. Well, great, that's fine, except for that I don't like those terms, you know what I mean? I, there's one company I know that has negotiated pretty well, and it's on the rangeland side, it's not farmland, but, but negotiated, and we're willing to do a, a actually really landowner-friendly contract, but that's one company, it's rangeland, and the, the people who got it were real big landowners, right? It wasn't like, Tiffany probably didn't, weren't going to get that, right? They could. So. Is the opportunity there? Yes. Is it easy to figure out exactly the logistics of it? I don't think so. But, but certainly that's an opportunity. And you're exactly right. You've got a commodity that they need. You know, what I don't know on the economics of it, and that's where like Justin's better than me at this, but like you have to really look at the economics. Because like you said, you're going to make $2 an acre, but if you spent 25 to get it, what are we doing, right? And then we may lose opportunity costs for other programs. Like I said, some of those other programs you may be out of. So I think there's a lot of analysis you have to do there to, to figure out exactly what would work for you. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. Logistically speaking, it's probably harder to do. Any other questions? I'll even take non-carbon questions if you have something else. Cody just got sweaty in the back thinking about that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you guys very much. Tiffany, thank you. That is the talk on the turn row right now, our carbon contracts, and I think you might have helped a lot of us out of some trouble. So thank you so much. I always enjoy your presentations. You don't speak lawyer talk, so I appreciate it very much. Uh, I've had the pleasure today to introduce David Washerman. Uh, David is the U.S. House Editor and Senior Election Analyst for the nonpartisan Cook Political Report. Nate Silver, the website 538, has written, Washman's knowledge of the nooks and crannies of political geography can make him seem like a local. And the Los Angeles Times has called Washerman whip smart and a scrupulously nonpartisan analyst whose numbers nerd them was foretold at a young age. I love that quote. In fall 2016, David drew a praise for his accurate pre-election analysis, including his piece, how Trump could win the White House while losing the popular vote. It was written two months before the election day, and in 2020, his forecast of Biden's win was correct in 49 of 50 states, missing only North Carolina. David has served as an analyst for the NBC News Decision Desk in every election since 2008, and has also appeared on Fox News, CNN, C-SPAN, and NPR. And, and I just want to add, uh, if, you know, there's not everybody gets to do and make a living off what their passion is. And David has that passion. And he, he's so good at it. He's so good at communicating. I didn't know if he has a, a crystal ball or what. Um, and then he can present it in a way that I can understand it. And it's such a pleasure to have him here. If you haven't heard him, you're in for a treat. If you have heard him, you're looking forward to what he has to say as much, much as I am. So David, thank you for being here. And we certainly look forward to your comments.
Thank you so much, Barry, for that wonderful introduction. That was excellent pronunciation, by the way. There's a line in my bio that says I'm a scrupulously nonpartisan analyst. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, there was someone introducing me who called me, uh, I could tell she was having a hard time reading the page, she called me a scrumptiously nonpartisan analyst. And so I said, I'll take it. Uh, now, it's great to be back here with, with you all. Uh, you know, I, I know I was scheduled to come in, in 2020 and it, it all went down at the last minute and, and so I'm so glad that we all get to be back here together. Um, I'm happy to stick around for lunch for any questions that we don't get to. Uh, but, uh, but it's just a, it's, it's a real treat. I, I've actually got some time this afternoon before the flight so uh, maybe, maybe uh, I, can, I can actually explore town a little bit, find a fiddle, we can have a front porch uh, picking session. Now, in West Texas terms, I suppose you'd say the headwinds facing Democrats in this midterm election uh, are a uh, category four or five dirt storm. And, uh, and, and even though uh, uh, Joe Biden's approval ratings were looking pretty good for much of 2021, uh, they've obviously uh, dipped quite a bit. We're gonna get into the overall political environment, the races that are gonna be critical for determining uh, control of Congress in 2022. And, uh, you know, uh, Joe Biden, uh, it's, it, it, it's kind of like going back to, uh, to, to the old line that Ronald Reagan said back in the 1980s. He, he said, I've left strict instructions to be awakened in, a, at a, uh, in the uh, event of a national emergency, even if I'm in the middle of a cabinet meeting. And, and right now, uh, American voters, particularly independent voters, they view the president as well-intentioned, but they, don't, they view him as too weak to simultaneously handle a foreign crisis and the domestic economy and inflation. Now, it's hard to get uh, more than 70% of voters to agree on anything these days. But when it comes to our posture towards Russia and Ukraine, American voters are pretty united. And if you look at the, uh, the most recent polling uh, that, uh, that uh, multiple organizations have conducted, according to the CBS YouGov poll, 87% say that the invasion of Ukraine matters to US interests. I think uh, a, a couple months ago, uh, most Americans couldn't have uh, have uh, picked out Ukraine on a map. 79% support banning imports of oil and gas uh, from Russia, even if it means higher gas prices. 71% oppose sending uh, US troops to Ukraine. And that's more or less been the posture that the administration has adopted towards, uh, towards, towards the situation. And yet one thing that hasn't changed a great deal is that uh, uh, Americans still view Biden's uh, uh, handling of, uh, of, of foreign policy in a pretty dim light. Only 47% approve of Biden's handling of Russia and Ukraine. So what's the disconnect here? Well, if you look at the overall arc of, uh, of the president's approval, which is now sunk to the low 40s, in the 538 average, uh, which is an aggregation of, uh, of all the national polls that, that, uh, that test uh, uh, approval of the administration. The moment at which those approval and disapproval lines crossed uh, was Afghanistan. And our mangled exit from Afghanistan called into question the competence card that, uh, that Joe Biden ran with in 2020. In 2020, he ran on a message of the guy in the White House came in with no government or military experience and, and is incapable of, of, of managing a pandemic. I was in the Senate for almost four decades. I was vice president for eight years. I've got this. And yet when we botched that exit, it called into question in the eyes of the independent voters who swing our elections in this country, whether he was up to the job. And 72% of voters say the country is on the wrong track. Now, if let's say in the next couple months, uh, we're fully beyond COVID, the situation, in Ukraine uh, uh, somehow improves and we have uh, something closer to a ceasefire, uh, could American voters be in a better mood? Well, th the problem for Joe Biden is that their foremost concern is the economy and inflation, and that isn't looking to improve uh, anytime soon, probably not before uh, the midterms. In May of one, Biden's handling of COVID, the economist YouGov large sample poll was 57%. Uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, today it's 49 percent on the economy 52 percent uh, it, it has dipped to 44 uh, percent but the immigration issue has been by far democrats weakest issue uh, the past couple years 43 percent approval in may of 2021 after what we've seen the past year along the border 36 percent in march of 2022 and when you poll uh, uh, texas it is really striking to see that, uh, that Hispanic voters in Texas, with whom uh, Joe Biden won probably around 60% of the vote in 2020, their approval of his, his handling of immigration is in the mid 30s uh, and, and overall approval in the high 30s. We could be headed for a, a total democratic collapse along the border if these numbers persist between now and November. Now, is there a chance that that Biden's approval gets better uh, between now and November? Of course there is, but typically once a honeymoon is over, it's over, as uh, Senator Cruz may have found out the hard way last year when he tried to rekindle some romance uh, in Cancun. Uh, now, on top of all that, Republican anti-Biden intensity, intensity has surged. Uh, and in, in, in 2020, uh, you know, the, the narrative on the Republican side about Joe Biden was that he was sleepy Joe, that um, he had dementia, right? As the line, lines that, uh, that the, uh, the former president was, uh, was putting out. And yet now, it's, it, it, now the Republican hostility uh, to Joe Biden uh, has, has taken over from any, any shred of, of sympathy. And the, the hostility rivals the, uh, the way Democrats felt about Donald Trump at this point in 2018. 73% of Republican voters not only disapprove of the job that Biden is doing, but strongly disapprove, up from 62% a year ago. And 61% of Republican voters rate their interest in the midterm elections as at least a nine uh, or 10 out of 10 uh, versus 47% of Democrats. And so you've got a big enthusiasm gap in the electorate right now that is driving a major change in election outcomes. And when you have this, this kind of hyper intensity on the Republican side, and Democrats who are demoralized because they were promised a broad agenda, and yet uh, 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 Democrats didn't have the majorities in Congress to be able to deliver on a large social spending plan or on, on changes to voting laws. You have the kind of outcomes that we saw in Virginia and New Jersey in November. In Virginia, a state that Joe Biden carried by 10 points, Glenn Youngkin, a Republican, won the governor's office by two. In New Jersey, a state uh, that voted for Biden by 16 points, the Democratic governor, Phil Murphy, hung on by three points, but that was still a 13-point shift from 2020. So we're talking about 12 and 13-point swings in voters' preferences in a matter of a year. If you were to superimpose that swing on the entire Congress in 2022 this fall, Democrats would not only lose four Senate seats and control of the Senate, they would lose 47 House seats. Keep in mind that Democrats can't afford to lose a single Senate seat to keep control of the Senate, and they can't afford to lose more than four House seats and keep control of the House. Now, I don't think Democrats are going to make gains that large for reasons I'll get into in a second, but it just gives you an idea of the magnitude of the shift we've seen in preferences. And Democrats are kind of divided on what their message ought to be for the fall. Uh, uh, half of Democrats say that Biden should go out there and sell his, his chief accomplishment, which was a bipartisan infrastructure package. And yet, voters are not convinced that infrastructure solves or does anything to address inflation. And the number one issue this fall is going to be the cost of living. Some Democrats say that they should pivot to, uh, to uh, attacking Republicans on some of the more social, uh, socially conservative legislation they've advanced at the state level, uh, just to simply fire up their base. If there's one wild card that could potentially drive Democratic enthusiasm up between now and November, it would be a Supreme Court ruling uh, due before the end of their term in October on, uh, on, on abortion. And uh, even though it's an issue that galvanizes Republicans, it galvanizes Democrats as well. And if both parties were to be, uh, be, be really engaged this fall, it would be an improvement for Democrats over what we're seeing now, potentially uh, curtail their losses. And looming over it all 
is a certain unemployed uh, uh, gentleman at Mar-a-Lago who has uh, some time on his hands. And what's curious about his involvement in the midterm elections is that he's not so much focused on ensuring that Republicans retake majorities in Congress. Um, he's focused on purifying the Republican Party and purging those who crossed him in the last few years. Now, for Trump, uh, you know, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot whether Republicans retake control of Congress, because typically when the out party uh, uh, takes the control two years in, they, over, they do something to overreach, and it ha helps the incumbent president rebound and win re-election. Think about 1994 with Newt Gingrich uh, coming into power, and they shut down the government, and Bill Clinton won re-election in 1996. And think about in 2010, when there was this whole Tea Party wave, and there was another government shutdown, and, uh, and, and Barack Obama uh, won re-election in 2012. I'm not sure that Trump wants the faces of the party, uh, of the Republican Party in, in uh, 2023 uh, to be Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates or some, or some of the others, but he is focused on ensuring that those who, uh, who voted for impeachment or those who don't believe that the election was stolen from him uh, are, are defeated or reined in. And yet he's not going out on the, on the road and raising a whole lot of money uh, for these candidates and he can't tweet endorsements anymore. And what, what that means is that a lot of his endorsees are left to fend for themselves. And you know, a couple of months ago, I would have thought that a Republican running in a, in a primary uh, against a Trump endorsed candidate uh, was running a Steinway campaign. They were just hoping that a piano would fall on their opponent's head. Uh, but Right now, we're seeing some more traditional Republican candidates who have a realistic chance of making it through primaries because, uh, because Trump, rather than raising money for other people, he's charging a lot of Republican donors money to come to Mar-a-Lago and whisper in his ear about who, sh who he should endorse. And so we may see when, when primary season starts uh, in earnest, I know Texas has already had its initial primary and we're headed into a runoff, uh, in the attorney general's race, and um, you know, I, I don't quite think George P. Bush is going to make it through that. But you could, but you've also seen some congressional races where uh, a, a more uh, a, a more conventional Republican, shall we say, has prevailed uh, over a more MAGA-oriented Republican, and we could see that pattern continue in a couple uh, couple primaries uh, to come. Now. Uh, as we dive into the, the races uh, themselves, just a couple of data points to frame what we're seeing nationally. Uh, Democrats start, with, start this uh, midterm season with no margin for error because in 2020, uh, they won uh, a lot of the states that are, that are up for grabs by very slim margins. Now, Joe Biden did win uh, the presidency with 306 electoral college votes, won 81 million votes to, uh, to Trump's 74 million nationally. Uh, that, that electoral college victory was a mirror image of when Trump won uh, 306 votes in 2016. But if you narrow down Biden's margin to, the, to just the states that put him over the top in the electoral college, he, the three closest states that, that made the difference uh, uh, between victory and defeat for both candidates were Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona. And when you add up Biden's margin of victory in those three states, it was 42,915 votes out of 159 million cast. Can't get much closer than that. And the same states that decided the, uh, the election in 2020, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, these are states that, are, that also have uh, key Senate races to decide uh, control of the Senate. Uh, and so Democrats can't afford any erosion from Biden's performance in 2020, and yet, of course, we've seen a ton of, a ton of erosion in their performance. Now, uh, I, uh, some of you know that I have a retail theory of politics, and, uh, and 10 years ago, during a slow news week at the Cook Political Report, I was curious which two retail chains were the best predictors of where Democrats and Republicans live and vote. And what I found was that the highest uh, the indexing chain for Democrats was Whole Foods Market, and the highest indexing chain for Republicans was Cracker Barrel Old Country Store. And in the past decade, I've, I've, I feel like I've just been vindicated because we've seen every Texas county with a Whole Foods Market trend towards Democrats, but we've seen pretty much every 
county that doesn't have a Whole Foods but has a Cracker Barrel or essentially the, the rest of the state trend towards Republicans, including South Texas. Uh, and in, uh, in, in 2020, uh, nationally, Joe Biden carried 85% of counties with uh, a Whole Foods and 32% and, uh, and, uh, of, of counties with a Cracker Barrel. That was a 53-point gap, three times the gap that we had back in 1992 between the very same counties. So Americans are choosing to live in places where the vast majority of their neighbors agree with their political and cultural values. And they also uh, are, are uh, voting more like their neighbors. And so we're kind of closed into these, these, uh, these echo chambers, if you will. Now, after the 2020 election, I was curious whether there were any chains that uh, had overtaken Whole Foods and Cracker Barrel as the leading indicators for the 2020s. And when I did this analysis down to the precinct level, what I found was that the new leading indicator for Democrats uh, was actually Lululemon Athletica, and the new leading indicator for Republicans was the tractor supply company. And uh, uh, you know, I know all of you shop at Lululemon. I'm going to have to really explain to you what tractor supply is. But uh, just uh, yeah, I know this is a this seems like a, a proxy for our divide between urban and, and rural America, and and it mostly is. But the leading growth sector for both of these chains is the suburbs. And tractor supply, they're up to 1,900 locations. They're not just selling to farmers and ranchers. They're selling to uh, weekend warriors uh, who live in subdivisions who want to convince their spouse that their, tra that their, uh, their riding mower is sexy. Uh, but uh, just a word of warning to those of you who uh, have, uh, have stopped into Lululemon for high-priced uh, yoga apparel. Uh, there are three things in my book that always tell the truth, and those are small children, drunk people and yoga pants, uh, so just be warned. <laughs> I love that, that picture. I think it's in Colorado. So let's talk about the Senate uh, this fall. There are seven races that I would consider part of the core Senate battlefield, and three of them are held by Republicans. Those are Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. Four of them are held by Democrats. Those are, uh, are New Hampshire, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. Now, if I had to guess today, I think uh, if the election were held next week, Republicans would pretty much sweep all seven of these races and, and retake the Senate by four seats. But as we've found out in the last few decades, Republicans are capable of screwing up two-car funerals. And I think they'll find a way to screw up at least two of these seven races. I can't say exactly how. Uh, I have some hunches. But that's why my overall prediction in the Senate is more like 52-48 for Republicans than 54-46. Why, why does that make a difference for governance next year? Well. As we've seen in the current Senate, Democrats basically can't get anything through without Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema agreeing to it. They've essentially taken the rest of the Senate Democrats hostage and Chuck Schumer has had to bow to, to what they want to be able to get 50 votes and pass anything. So Democrats uh, have pretty much an ungovernable majority in, in the Senate uh, right now. If Republicans retake the Senate with 51 or 52 seats, then that pendulum swings over to the same kind of gang of moderates just on the Republican side. People like Susan Collins and Mitt Romney and Ben Sass and maybe Lisa Murkowski from Alaska if she survives her election, which is not a given. And, and the other reason is that if Republicans do run up the score this cycle, they could potentially win a supermajority in the Senate in 2024. Because in 2024, there are eight vulnerable Democratic seats up for election in the Senate, including three in really, really red states. West Virginia, where I don't think Manchin is going to run again. Ohio, where Sherrod Brown is, and John Tester in Montana. And meanwhile, there's not a single uh, vulnerable Republican Senate seat up for election in 2024. So the Senate could really get away from Democrats in a hurry. Now, out of the seats that Republicans currently hold, Democrats' best pickup opportunity is in Pennsylvania, where you've got the bloodiest, nastiest Republican primary underway in, and most expensive primary in, in, perhaps in, in history between a certain television personality who goes by Dr. Oz 
uh, and a hedge fund executive uh, named David McCormick, neither of whom have lived in Pennsylvania for most of the last three decades. Uh, McCormick has lived in Connecticut, and Dr. Oz has had a mansion in New Jersey. So that could create a unique opening for Democrats. The other kind of question mark for Republicans on this battlefield is Herschel Walker in Georgia. Now, he's a legendary former Georgia Bulldog and NFL star. Uh, he has Trump's endorsement. It looks like he's going to make it through the primary, although there's going to be some money spent uh, to try and prevent him from, from winning it without a runoff. But Herschel Walker uh, could be a problematic general election nominee, to say the least, against uh, Democrat Raphael Warnock. Uh, not only did he uh, he, was, he alleged to have held a, a, a gun up to, an, uh, to his ex-wife's head, but uh, he's been open about his struggles with, uh, with uh, dissociative identity disorder and having uh, uh, um, alternate personalities. And uh, when a reporter asked him uh, a couple months ago whether he would have supported the bipartisan infrastructure package, he didn't seem to know what it was. And so candidates who haven't run before and are new to this game, will they survive scrutiny. Probably the most valuable staffer on any Democratic campaign this fall is going to be the tracker, uh, the, the person with a video camera or smartphone going around following uh, the Republican to see if they'll screw up and say anything that will get them in trouble. But overall, you know, Republicans in a lot of these other races are in decent uh, shape. And, and uh, I think uh, Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada, Mark Kelly in Arizona, they're in real trouble. Uh, now, there are also some important primaries to watch that will determine what kind of Republican majority we'll have in 2023. There are five open seats in the Senate, uh, and uh, you know, Vermont's an easy hold for Democrats, not much drama there. But there are four primaries for pretty safe Republican seats that pit more moderate candidates against more conservative Republicans. Uh, Alabama is an example of that where uh, you had a, a Freedom Caucus endorsee in Mo, Congressman Mo Brooks who uh, just lost Trump's endorsement uh, and, and a, a, a more conventional uh, Republican named Katie Britt who is former uh, uh, Chief of Staff to Senator Richard Shelby. In Missouri though, you've got probably the wildest uh, Republican primary besides Pennsylvania. You've got former Governor Eric Greitens who resigned the governorship uh, in 2018 after allegedly tying up a woman who was not his wife in his basement. And, uh, and Trump has not made an endorsement in that race, and Greitens is the, is the front runner uh, right now to win the Republican primary. There's still time for the field to coalesce uh, behind someone else, but if, uh, if Republicans are spending a dime in Missouri come this fall, it will be because uh, Eric Greitens is their nominee. And uh, then there are also a couple of Republican incumbents who have to watch their right flank, including uh, the, uh, in, uh, the senator from Arkansas who is in line to chair uh, the Ag Committee, John Bozeman. He does have Trump's endorsement, and so I think he'll be okay, but he's facing a, a kind of time for change challenge from a younger Republican named Jake Biquette, who is also a former uh, NFL player uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, James Lankford is, is, has a, a primary from a, a Baptist minister who attacks him for voting to certify the 2020 election result. We'll see if Trump gets involved there. And then in Alaska, where uh, Lisa Murkowski is probably the most vociferously anti-Trump Republican in the Senate, uh, she is facing a, a Trump-endorsed uh, candidate named Kelly Shabaka, uh, who hasn't raised much money. but. Uh, Alaska is a state that, that voted for Trump by 10 points. It's a pretty conservative electorate, and it's possible that, uh, that Murkowski will lose, even with a very unique uh, uh, primary election system that allows Democrats to cross over and vote uh, in both the primary and the general election for Murkowski. Now, in the House, there are 222 Democrats and 213 Republicans right now, and that means that Republicans only need five seats to dethrone Nancy Pelosi and make Kevin McCarthy speaker. Now, I think they'll get there because they're already really, really close. In 2020, they picked up a dozen House seats, uh, even though the polls had predicted that Democrats were, were going to pick up seats. And in fact, Republicans came within 31,751 votes in six races of winning the majority last time. 
Uh, how did Republicans beat the odds? Well, they nominated a lot of candidates who didn't look or sound like Donald Trump. In fact, all 16 of the Republicans who flipped Democratic seats were women and or minorities, and, and, uh, including uh, um, people like Burgess Owens in Utah uh, and, and uh, uh, Carlos Jimenez in, in Miami. We saw Tony Gonzalez get elected outside of San Antonio here. And so Republicans were able to actually win nine districts that Joe Biden carried at the top of the ticket. They're reprising that strategy for 2022 and in fact are, are running a very diverse array of candidates who defy the stereotype of the Republican Party as a bunch of crusty old white guys. And I think the stars of the show here in Texas will be three Latinos who are contesting uh, the three Democratic seats in South Texas. More on, uh, on those seats in a minute. Now, uh, one factor that's really hurting Democrats in the House is that a lot of their incumbents are heading for the exits. Uh, I know you can't read the names on this chart, but uh, the list of Democrats retiring on the left is longer than my arm. We've got 31 Democrats who are not seeking re-election because they know that this two-year window is really their opportunity to be impactful in Congress and that beyond uh, 2022, uh, being in the minority would kind of suck. And you've got 16 Republicans who aren't seeking re-election, but many of them are running for statewide office like, uh, like governor or in Louis Gohmert's case, running a, a, a hopeless campaign for attorney general. Uh, but some of these Democratic seats are going to be really, really ha hard for the party to hold, uh, including people like Ron Kine's seat in western Wisconsin or Sherry Busos's seat in northwest Illinois. And is some of the Democrats with the most uh, experience uh, on ag issues, uh, people like Philemon Vela from South Texas, uh, he's leaving early. Uh, uh, and, and that really leaves a brain drain on the Democratic side of the, uh, the House Ag Committee when it comes to commodities. Uh, recruitment is another area where Republicans are doing really well in House races. Of the 21 Republicans who lost by six points or less in 2020, 11 have already an announced for uh, 2022, including uh, Monica De La Cruz in South Texas, who came shockingly within three points of beating Vicente Gonzalez, a Democrat who had usually won by 20 points or more. Uh, and, and that was a race that was, uh, that was nearly a big upset in 2020. Well, she's running again. By contrast of the 21 Democrats who lost by six points or less in 2020, only two of them are running again. So Democrats have a full-blown recruitment crisis in terms of the, the candidates uh, on their side being willing to run for Congress. The one kind of bright spot for, redistrict, for Democrats has been redistricting. Now, we have the, uh, the, the census every 10 years, and what makes 2022 unique is that this is a redistricting year, and every state has to redraw their lines except for the lucky six states that only have one district. Uh, we're up to 45 states that have, have uh, finalized new boundaries for 2022. And there are, under the new lines in those 45 states, there are eight more Biden won seats uh, versus the current lines. How did that come to be? Well, uh, three reasons. First of all, you can't get more, much more skewed towards Republicans than the lines that were passed after the 2011 census, because that was following the 2010 wave when Republicans managed to pick up 600 state legislative seats. They had uh, five times as much power in state legislatures to, to draw and gerrymander the districts in their favor than Democrats, and they took full advantage of that. Uh, but the other reason is that Democrats have been much more aggressive than Republicans in gerrymandering the lines in the states they control this time. In New York State, uh, Democrats passed a gerrymander uh, that, uh, that uh, essentially tries to cut the number of Republicans from that state from eight to four. Uh, they're going for a 22 to 4 uh, majority in the state of New York, whereas in Texas, Republicans uh, sought mostly uh, to, to keep uh, what they currently have. Now, uh, just to give you an example of how gerrymandering works, uh, this is a, a time-honored uh, American tradition. This is the map that Democrats drew 10 years ago in the state of Maryland, which they control. And believe it or not, these are actual congressional districts that are in effect today. And uh, if you can kind of make out this district in purple that snakes all the way, you know, from Annapolis uh, to some uh, parts of Baltimore, 
uh, that's Maryland's third district. A federal judge the other year uh, called it a broken-winged pterodactyl lying prostrate across the road. And, uh, and believe it or not, uh, this was the way that Democrats were able to win seven of Maryland's eight districts by spreading out Democratic voters across far-flung parts of the state. And uh, they tried to pass a map this time that would give them all eight of Maryland's districts, but a state judge just threw it out. So we're, see we're actually starting to see some uh, uh, state courts uh, put guardrails up or say, hey, this is too far uh, when it comes to gerrymandering because neither Congress nor the U.S. Supreme Court have stepped in to do anything about it. And on net, that's benefited Democrats because state courts that, were, that are led by partisan Democratic judges in North Carolina and Pennsylvania threw out Republican gerrymanders. And we're beginning to see some state courts like Maryland's do the same to Democrats, but on net, that has helped Democrats in, uh, in redistricting. Uh, now, another factor is the, uh, simply the census data that's used to draw these new districts. And the result of the 2020 census showed that 52% of America's counties actually lost population between 2010 and 2020. Those are the counties in, in red. Uh, and we saw, as we usually do, more population shifting to urban and suburban areas, and those areas are increasingly blue. So that has helped Democrats a little bit as well. Now, Democrats celebrate that the country is not only growing more urban, but more diverse. The, uh, the non-Hispanic white share of the population, according to the census, fell from 64% in 2010 to 58% in 2020. And yet, uh, Democrats' predictions of their demographic advantage have not really come to fruition. The popular vote margin that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won in 2020 was pretty much identical to the margin that Barack Obama and Joe Biden won in, in 2012. And so what happened that explains why even though Republicans' demographic base seems to be shrinking, uh, uh, Republicans are doing quite well. Well, it's because Democrats have lost so much uh, uh, appeal with Hispanic voters in particular, but other minority groups as well. Uh, in 2020, uh, uh, Donald Trump won an 8% greater share of Hispanic voters than he did in 2016. He won a 3% uh, greater share of black voters and a 1% greater share of Asian voters. Uh, and if you think about uh, why that happened, in 2016, Donald Trump's message to Hispanic voters, first of all, he didn't run any Spanish language ads in, in 2016, but his message to Hispanic voters was essentially, uh, build the wall and, and by the way, Trump Tower serves the best taco bowls. Well, in 2020, he ran a robust Spanish language advertising campaign, and his message was much more focused on the economy and calling Democrats the party of lockdowns and socialism and out of control border policies. Remember that debate stage when, uh, when the moderator asked the 10 Democratic candidates running for president uh, whether they would support decriminalizing illegal border crossings, and most Democrats, including Kamala Harris on that stage, raised their hand. That's a big problem uh, for, for Democrats, in, uh, particularly uh, with uh, Hispanic voters who uh, have been eligible to vote for, uh, for many years. And so we're seeing, we, we saw enormous swings in 2020, particularly in South Texas. I know it's uh, probably not new information, but you know, an example would be Starr County, Rio Grande City, voted for Hillary Clinton by 60 points. It only voted for Joe Biden by five points in 2020. And when you poll uh, uh, um, along the border right now, uh, it, you know, Republicans are continuing uh, to surge. Now, in terms of the census's effect on which states have congressional uh, seats, Texas was once, against the big, uh, once again the big winner in the census, picking up two seats, Florida, North Carolina, Colorado, Montana, Oregon, each picking up a seat. California lost a seat for the first time since gaining statehood. Illinois, uh, Michigan, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, each losing a seat. Uh, and Minnesota beat out New York for the final seat in the House by just 26 residents. So it's amazing what a difference just a handful of census forms made. Uh, now, in terms of what Republicans were able to do here in Texas, this is the old congressional map that's been effect, in effect for the last uh, 10 years. And Republicans currently hold 23 out of 36 seats. But as you can tell, a lot of these seats 
over time have gotten to be a, a um, lighter shade of red because as Democrats have experienced a lot of vote growth in major metro areas outside, uh, you know, su suburbs of San Antonio, Austin, uh, uh, DFW, and Houston, uh, a lot of the districts that Republicans drew uh, uh, intending to be safe seats 10 years ago became very competitive. And nine out of the 23 districts Republicans hold actually gave Joe Biden more than 47% of the vote in 2020. So Republicans who controlled uh, redistricting, as they usually do, they had a decision to make. Texas picking up two seats. How are we going to both win those seats and safeguard our our, our existing ones that are experiencing a, 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 you know, more of a purple turn. Well, what they decided to do was pretty smart. Uh, I, I know we'd have to zoom in on this map to be able to see it, but they drew one of Texas's new seats to be uh, uh, just in Austin. Now, Austin used to be cracked six different directions, but Republicans simply decided to draw a district that you know, puts a fence around um, uh, every Austin voter with a PhD in aromatherapy candle making. And, uh, and as a result, uh, they were able to purge a lot of Democrats from the surrounding seats and make all of their, their existing seats safer. So now all of these Republican held districts are back to being Trump plus 20 districts. Now, uh, the, uh, the way that Republicans were able to offset that was by changing the lines in South Texas. Uh, they turned the 15th district, which runs from San, uh, San Antonio down to McAllen, they turned that district from Biden plus two to Trump plus three. Uh, and when Philem unveiled, the Democrat from the neighboring district in Brownsville decided to retire. Vicente Gonzalez, the incumbent uh, in the 15th district, decided just to move over and run there. So now Republicans have an excellent pickup opportunity in, uh, in not only that district, but the 28th district, which is Laredo running up to San Antonio. Now this is probably the wildest Democratic primary of 2022. And one of the most important for uh, the future of Democrats in ag. Because Henry Cuellar is one of the last moderate to conservative Democrats left standing in Congress. And yet he is under assault on his left fr flank from Jessica Cisneros, his former intern who's an Im immigration lawyer running with the endorsements of Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And they've poured millions of dollars into her campaign to try and take him out. And in the first round, she held Cuellar to barely under 50% 50, 50 of the vote, which means it's headed to a runoff on May 24th. I think this is going to be a true test of the future of the Democratic Party right here in Texas. Because Henry Cuellar is in a real bind. Uh, in the first round, he benefited from a lot of, of local races along, in counties along the border that drove out Democratic turnout, and they also cast a ballot for Cuellar. Keep in mind that uh, the FBI raided his house uh, back in January, uh, which was, was in the news, although um, you know, he claims he did nothing wrong, and it, uh, we'll, we'll see what, the, what uh, comes of, of it legally. But this time around in the runoff, he's not going to have the benefit of all the, those local races driving turnout. Uh, what's more, Cisneros is able to raise a lot of money off of Bernie's list, uh, and, and whereas Cuellar, he was relying on a whole lot of, uh, of PAC checks and, and, and a lot of ag groups and energy groups uh, coming to his aid. He spent a lot of that money on the first round. If Cuellar loses this runoff, I believe Republicans will take this seat because Cisneros is too far left to be able to hold the seat for the Democrats. And so, you know, if, if that happens, it could be a total collapse uh, for Democrats along the border. We're watching that race extremely closely. Now, if you were to take stock of the House overall, I think Republicans are on track to gain somewhere between 50, 15 and 30 House seats, which would be more than enough to make Kevin McCarthy uh, speaker. If not for redistricting, I would say Republicans would be on track to gain something like 20 to 35 seats, but that might, or it might curtail uh, 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 Republicans just a little bit. There are far more vulnerable Democratic House seats uh, than there are Republican House seats, including uh, several here in Texas. Uh, and just like in the Senate, there are going to be a lot of primaries that determine what flavor of Republican comes to Washington in 2023. 
And this is going to be key because, you know, I believe Glenn Thompson from Pennsylvania will be the next chair of the Ag Committee, and he's well respected on both sides of the aisle. But he's got to contend with people on his right flank who are pushing to major changes to the nutrition title, as they always are. And of course, Democrats, uh, and there are fewer Democrats on the Ag Committee who come from farms, farm districts. Colin Peterson, the former chair, lost his, his seat in 2018. So uh, how is this going to shape up? Well, uh, I put the, the vulnerable Republicans uh, uh, in primaries into kind of two categories. On the left, we've got two Republicans who, who voted to impeach Trump in, in uh, 2021, and there were 10 Republicans overall who voted to impeach Trump. Three of them are retiring. Uh, uh, another two of them, Liz Cheney in Wyoming and, uh, uh, and Tom Rice from South Carolina, I think have very little pathway to renomination in their contest. But people, like, people on the Ag Committee like Dan Newhouse on the center left there, uh, uh, who come from a, uh, a top two primary state, a state where Democrats are allowed to vote uh, on an open ballot for uh, not only the primary but the general election, it's possible that Dan Newhouse could come back as a moderate on the Ag Committee with Democratic votes in his district in rural Washington state. The, the races that I think are going to, to uh, be the, the true difference makers, though, are Republicans who did not vote to impeach, but crossed Trump in some other way, whether it was just voting to certify the election results, voting for the January 6th investigation, or voting for the bipartisan infrastructure package. That's why I'm watching races involving members like Rodney Davis from Illinois, who's also on the Ag Committee. Uh, he's a very uh, conscientious member uh, who uh, is very constituent services oriented, uh, pretty popular moderate Republican uh, who's focused on, on legislating versus a, a Republican endorsed uh, by Trump, uh, uh, also an incumbent named Mary Miller, who is more of the MAGA uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene crowd in the House. I'm also watching Nancy Mace in South Carolina, uh, who uh, is being challenged by a Trump endorsed candidate in, in South Carolina. And a couple months ago, I would have said uh, they're in really, really big trouble. But now I think there is a pathway uh, for them to get past these Trump endorsed candidates, particularly because Trump's kind of America first isolationist brand has fallen a little bit out of favor with most Republican primary voters now that we're, we're focused on, on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, there are also 36 gubernatorial elections on the ballot this fall. I, I won't get into all of them. Um, Beto, uh, you know, Beto's chances of winning the governorship are probably similar to my chances of winning the Tour de France next year. Uh, but uh, I do think we'll, we'll have some drama in Georgia, where uh, Brian Kemp is running for re-election, facing both former Senator David Perdue, who's endorsed by Trump, uh, and Stacey Abrams once again. Uh, I actually think Trump bashing Kemp in the, uh, in the primary phase could help Kemp win more independent suburban voters in the general election and fend off Stacey Abrams. Uh, but overall, Republicans are in good shape to take, take uh, 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 more governor's offices from Democrats, possibly in Kansas, Michigan, uh, Nevada, Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, and, of course, the 2024 presidential race uh, will uh, keep us in suspense for some time because neither of these men have much incentive to announce their plans anytime soon. Uh, neither Trump nor Biden wants to come across as a, as a lame duck. Now, I would put Trump's odds of running in 2024 slightly higher than Joe Biden's. Uh, and. You know, if you look at an actuarial table, there's there's a pretty good chance that at least one of these people will not be um, uh, on the ballot in, in 2024. Uh, but let's just say for a moment, and I do think that if Trump runs the nomination, it really is still his to lose. His approval rating among Republicans is still in the 80s. And yet, uh, if let's just say that Trump does not run for whatever reason, I would put the, the Republicans who badly want to succeed him into three categories, senators, governors, and former Trump administration people. And clearly in the governor's camp right now, Ron DeSantis is the flavor of the year. Uh, he's confrontational, he's got, got a lot of Trump style, and uh, he's polling really well. 
Uh, in the former Trump administration official lane, you've got Nikki Haley, Mike Pompeo, and Mike Pence has kind of resurfaced uh, uh, in the last few months, although I think a lot of the base thinks he's a Democrat. Uh, and, but in the, in the Senate category, uh, my sleeper pick for 2024 is Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. He has quietly built a very impressive political operation. He uh, is, is also, uh, uh, you know, obviously defies the stereotype of who Republicans are. Democrats uh, have a real dilemma on their hand because half the party does not want Joe Biden to run at age 82. And if Biden does not endorse his own vice president, uh, for the nomination, then it would be essentially admission of failure uh, on the part of his administration. AOC will be eligible to run by three weeks. She'll just she'll turn 35 before the 2024 election. But does she have uh, the the ability to build a, a, an appealing national campaign as an avowed uh, democratic socialist? I'm count me skeptical. And so that leaves open a really big hole on the Democratic side for someone in the Biden mold. Is it a governor like a Gretchen Whitmer? Is it is it uh, someone like Senator A.B. Klobuchar. We'll see, but I think there is an appetite for someone new on the Democratic side. I'll just leave you with one uh, historical fact. There have uh, only been three presidents in the history of the country that have never had a pet in the White House, and none of them have won a second term. Uh, those would be James K. Polk, Andrew Johnson, and Donald Trump. And we know that Trump is not going to pick Pence again as his running mate in 2024. So this is my prediction of who I think Trump will, uh, will select uh, to win voters over. Uh, I, I know lunch is coming up soon. Do we have time for a question? All right, let's take, let's take one question. Yes. Yeah, any hope for someone, someone, someone like Larry Hogan in Maryland? Look, the, the dilemma for, for kind of the pre-Trump wing of the party that wants to take the, the party back from Trump, the, you know, there's a new word for, for to dislike Donald Trump, and that's Democrats. Uh, and even though Larry Hogan is, is waving the flag for the remnant of the party that's still left, uh, I don't think he or Mitt Romney or others in that wing have enough Republican voters left uh, to be able to get past a Republican primary. So the, I think the, probably about the most moderate Republican the party would be capable of nominating in 2024 is someone like Scott from South Carolina. Um, I'll stick around for lunch uh, uh, if there are any questions we didn't get to. Thank you so much for having me back and, uh, and I'll keep praying for rain. Take care. Sorry about that. All right, well, I will be very quick, but again, I want to appreciate uh, David Wasserman for his political insight. It's always a uh, breadth of knowledge and certainly uh, an evolving topic, but really appreciate you being here. Uh, greatly appreciate our keynote speaker sponsor, Farmers Cooperative Compress. We certainly could not do this without our uh, specific sponsors uh, to conduct this meeting. So really appreciate the and appreciate uh, the breakfast this morning that was sponsored by Delta Pine. Uh, also have a, uh, a uh, the drink, the coffee and water sponsor, Tucker Oil. And then soon after this, we will have lunch here in just a moment, sponsored by Fibermax BASF. So please, if you see those folks, uh, give them a round of applause, shake their hand, and tell them thank you, because this meeting would not be possible without that support. Uh, I'm going to give you just a quick, brief year end overview. Uh, certainly, this year has been very unique in the fact that we've had uh, an ever evolving change of weather, much like we've seen the last couple of, of weeks. Uh, but those that remember, uh, we started off this year uh, vastly interesting. We had one of the largest and hardest cold spells we've seen in 60 years across the entire state, uh, completely wiping out uh, our electrical system, or at least stress testing it as best as it could. Um, and it was dry. Uh, certainly, if you look at this time last year, we were uh, by means no, not really in great shape. But fortunately, Mother Nature was very good to us last year, um, just kind of out of nowhere. Um, it started to rain. Uh, you can see the one on the left was this time last year. The one on the right was as we got through the planning deadline of June 15th. And we just continued to kind of have some very timely rainfall throughout the year. 
uh, very good temperature. Um, and then segue into kind of the, the cutout type of season where we started to lose some moisture and certainly uh, this graph is indicative of that. Um, but, so the year was pretty good. Typically our abandonment rate within the area, these are some numbers that Sean and I put together, uh, but a 10 year average is about a 32% abandonment rate uh, within this region. This year alone was about 11.5%. Uh, when you equate that from some yield estimates and some acreage uh, estimates we have put together, that's about a 4.7 million bale crop that we're looking at this year. Uh, still a few, uh, one gym we know of that's uh, uh, wrapping up within our region, so this number's probably pretty close. And then you look at the state as a whole, uh, while NAS is predicting about 7.6 million, uh, if you look at at least the, uh, the yield estimates based on the, the total planted acres, it roughs up to about 8.3. Uh, of course, these are just rough estimates, not hard, uh, fast line numbers, and we'll know the final toward the end of May. Uh, we had good opportunity, good pricing opportunity, something that kind of combined itself. Had it not been for uh, a good crop and good pricing opportunity, it would have been a very bleak type of year. Uh, we had great policy initiatives that finished out for the year. Uh, Congress was able to muster up enough support to finish out the, the 19 WIP Plus. Uh, we had extended assistance, if you remember back in September with the, the, uh, ex the uh, extension bill, to have funding for the 20 and 21. Uh, WIP plus, if you will, or whatever they're going to call the disaster related program as it's being implemented. COVID-19 assistance, the $20 per acre that we saw implemented the first part of the year, and then PLC ARC assistance that was handed out uh, in October for the 2020 crop year. And I, I cup all this, a lot of these policy initiatives have been worked on very aggressively by our organization, coupled with the National Cotton Council, coupled with National Sorghum and our Coalition of the Willing, Coalition of the Willing uh, Texas and Florida sugarcane, and certainly our other partners. And that's why we have these strong safety net provisions that kick in when we need them. Uh, but it's because of a, a strong advocacy front that we do together. It certainly was not without its challenges. Uh, as we heard from, from Peyton a little while ago, uh, we had a lot of issues with uh, supply chain demands, shipping delays, shipping issues. Uh, same with labor. Uh, certainly had a huge impact on our marketing side as well as just availability of, of a, a workforce. And that caused for a little bit of stumble. So what is 2022 gonna look like? Well, who knows? Um, it's still kind of up in the air from a planted acreage estimate. I know USDA put out their estimations yesterday. Uh, they estimated Texas to have about 6.8 million planted acres up about 7%. Uh, if you kind of look, this is our region as a whole. These are certified 578 reports. Um, on average, we'll plant about 3.8 million acres within our region. Based on USDA estimates on a forecast, um, we're looking at it about uh, a little over 4 million acres, so maybe 4.2, 4.3, again, just kind of an estimation. Production's kind of the kicker, who knows yet. Um, if we continue to have the, the weather-related conditions we're seeing today, um, it's certainly gonna be a, a big goose egg or a question mark um, as time continues. Uh, on average, we usually produce about 3.5 to 3.7 million bales within our region. So hopefully we'll be above average uh, certainly, uh, we don't want to be around the 11 or 2020 mark. That was a, a very rough, rough uh, type of condition, but, but time will tell. We do have some challenges ahead. There's no doubt about that. Uh, weather is certainly a condition that everybody is focused on, something we always continue to watch, something that is uh, well without of our control. Uh, but the good thing is we have good policy to help uh, mitigate some of these risks. Input costs continue to be a large focus. I mean, we'll continue to be throughout this year, whether that's the pricing itself or availability of product, and we continue to be very sensitive and very focused on how can we address uh, some of these issues within our, within our power. Positivity standpoint, we do have some pricing opportunity. Um, I see, you know, Sam you know, is here in the room as a marker. I see Keith Lucas um, as, a, as a pretty strong marker as well and some others in the room, but there are pricing opportunities. So that is a positive focus, at least for right now, going into this year as we start to look at planning a crop. A lot of heightened sense of advocacy. Uh, you know, we heard from our farm policy panel. I thought they did a very good job of outlining some of the, uh, the issues we continue to face and what we're looking at moving forward. Um, as it would stand today, if we were to write a farm bill or look at farm policy today, this would be the, the committee of jurisdiction that would make up to do it. The House Ag Committee is currently chaired by David Scott, uh, the ranking member G.T. Thompson. If uh, Wasserman is co correct on his predictions, and I, I uh, presume he very well may be, uh, then G.T. would take the reins of the committee itself. Uh, but as Jennifer mentioned, I think this is kind of something we continue to focus on and be mindful of. Um, per the 18 Farm Bill, there's 151 today, 151 House members that have never casted a single vote on a Farm Bill. 
In Texas alone, 55% of our members today, 21 of 38, have never voted on Farm Bill before. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in the near term and long term to try to get to speed and get these folks up to, up to snuff on farm policy and our importance and value of issues. Same in the Senate, there's 23 senators who have never voted on a farm bill before. So a lot of groundwork to lay ahead as we move forward. So I'll, I'll end with this um, and take questions if y'all have time, but I do wanna shed some positivity. I know there's a lot of just concern and focus on weather related conditions, what the crop may or may not look like, planning conditions going forward. And, uh, and certainly that is, is something we will always focus on going into this time of year. Uh, I love literacy that is kind of leadership driven and so forth. And this is a quote by uh, Jim Collins, a uh, concept of first who, then what? Get the right people on the bus. So kind of keep that on, get the right people on the bus. Those who build great organizations, make sure they have the right people on the bus, the right people in the key seats before they figure out where to drive the bus. So get the right people in the right seats, right people on the bus. You can do a lot of great things. This is something that I think really shapes up to kind of where we're headed. So when facing chaos and uncertainty, and you cannot possibly predict what's coming around the corner, your best strategy is to have a busload of people who can adapt to form brilliantly no matter what comes next. Think about that. You know, we're set up to have a lot of challenges going into this year, but as so long as we have the right people on the bus and the right people in the right seats, we can do amazing things. Great vision without great people is irrelevant. Great vision without great people is irrelevant. It's very true. I focus on that because this is our 65th annual meeting. 65th. Most people haven't been around as long as 65 years. I certainly have not. But we've had a great vision for a long time. And a lot of great people for us to carry out the right people on the right and people in the right seat and have driven this organization for a long time in the right direction. W.O. Fortenberry was certainly one of the earliest visionaries, the founding president of PCG. You have the outgoing chairman of the board, Stacy, and those that have come in between certainly have carried us in the right direction. The right people on the bus, the right people in the right seats have created great vision. Lots of folks that have come before us that have carried this organization through a lot of challenges, changes over time. But we've been very successful in advocacy, very successful in research and development, and that has truly enhanced this area, this organization, and results for producers across the board. Faces have changed a little bit, uh, but certainly we continue to have the right people on the bus and the right people in the right positions to drive this organization. I certainly wanna highlight that as we move forward, and we'll continue to do that. Last day I leave, I certainly want to recognize our staff. Um, I get the great ability to travel and see a lot of neat accords and work on behalf of the organization, but a leadership of an organization is only as good as the people that are steering the boat. And certainly uh, we have, I would attest, the best staff in any organization across the US. Um, we can go toe to toe with anybody on any issue. Um, it's because we have the right people on the bus and the right people in the right seats. Sean, our policy director uh, for uh, analysis and research. Mark Brown, our director of field services. David Denson, our office manager. And our newest addition, Kara Bishop, who serves as our director of communications and public affairs. Um, certainly, if y'all see them, please give them a gratitude of thanks. This meeting is possible because of all of them. Like I said, I get to stand up here and, and say a few words.